All right, so this is the fifth and final class in this series. Um, and then typically we would um, just go right into the next uh, class in this series. But as I mentioned before, two of those Tuesdays here, um, you know, Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. So uh, we decided not to, uh, it seemed uh, counterproductive to um, to try to hold class on Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve. So the next uh, class, which is uh, Meditation 101, begins in January, first Tuesday in January, just so you're aware that people watching uh, at home are aware. So Thank you we, for that. Thank you. So uh, last class, we focused a lot on uh, bodhicitta, uh, the motivation of a great scope practitioner, the motivation, uh, the wish to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings without exception. And that motivation is not something that just, you know, comes about. It's not random. Um, a person trains in bodhicitta. They, as we talked about, they use one of those two or a combination of those two meditative techniques of uh, the six point cause and effect meditation and or equalizing and exchanging self-cherishing for other cherishing. Um, they practice those techniques. And, and of course, you know, we've gone through the whole Lam Rim, you know, really extremely quickly but of course the understanding is that you know these scopes really you know depend upon you know later um realizations depend upon um prior realizations and so you know you have to really be a master of the small scope in order to then be a master of the middle scope which then allows you to become you know a, a real practitioner to um to really master the great scope um, but we've just gone through it so quickly that, you know. Um, that, you know, that it, it we've sort of glossed over all of those realizations. But, you know, it's really, it's really multi-lifetimes, potentially, you know, multi-lifetimes of um, st study and practice and meditation to to get to the point where bodhicitta is something that a person, you know, could realistically accomplish you know because they they if if the person doesn't have renunciation if they don't you know definitely wish we said that you know one definition of renunciation or or another way of phrasing it is definite emergence the wish to definitely emerge from suffering which means that you've given up on trying to find some combination of you know outer conditions that that you're satisfied with that, you know, oh, well, I, if I just get this and I just get this, then I'm done, I've made it, you know, you, you have to really give up from the Buddhist perspective in order, because why would you achieve, why would you want to achieve enlightenment if samsara was working out, you know, if, if you were comfortable within cyclic existence, if you really felt like there was some combination of external conditions that you could bring together and then that would be the the best possible state well if if that's your view then enlightenment isn't something that you would strive for um, you would simply strive to do that you would simply strive to bring those conditions together and so of course without renunciation then bodhicitta is impossible um, and without really understanding all of the drawbacks of cyclic existence, a lot of which you're doing on the small scope, and then more of which you're doing on the middle scope, renunciation, you know, would never dawn in the mind. So it really is this progressive system of, you know, this realization leading to that realization and so on. But if we assume that a person is a bodhisattva now because they're a practitioner of the great scope and they've trained their mind using six point cause and effect uh, equalizing and exchanging self-cherishing for other cherishing and and now bodhicitta becomes their kind of baseline state every action of body speech and mind is geared toward achieving one's enlightenment not for oneself but for the benefit of all other sentient beings then what comes into play next um, are the six perfections, 
which are here on the screen. We can't go into a lot of detail um, on these. We'll touch on them briefly. Um, Lamazo Barimpeche has a book called, literally called The Six Perfections. If you want to, you know, read an entire book on this topic, it's it's Lamazo Barimpeche's Six The Six Perfections is is a really good book on the topic. Um, but this is what a bodhisattva trains in. This is what once a person has achieved, this is sort of their mission, is to train in the six perfections once bodhicitta is, you know, truly dawning in their mind. So generosity is the first of the six perfections, and these are all uh, states of mind. These are all, because, um, you know, um, Buddhism has had a uh, significant monastic component to it going back to the time of the Buddha. The Buddha himself went forth into homelessness. He ordained monks and nuns who went forth into homelessness. So these are not, you know, people who, to some degree, they are, um, you know, somewhat separated from the busyness of modern, you know, even at that time, sort of, you know, commerce and trade and, you know, government and all sort of those um, systems, you know, they, they were sort of separated from that in a way. And yet they were able to, so what I mean is that these are things that you can largely accomplish through meditation. Um, it isn't, you know, there are components of these that do relate to other sentient beings, you know, actually being in relation to them. But also at the same time, these are states of mind that can be cultivated um, in meditation in one's formal practice. So generosity is not, you know, it, it doesn't depend upon actually, you know, preventing poverty in the world. Because if that were true, then the Buddha couldn't have achieved his enlightenment, No, because poverty has always existed. There have always been people who needed generosity. So it doesn't mean that a person or a group is actually successfully eliminating, um, you know, states of deprivation. Um, but it's a mental state where it's a willingness that genuinely exists in the mind of the practitioner to give away whatever is necessary, to give away whatever is beneficial to, you know, whatever is helpful for sentient beings. Doesn't, and that has to be trained in skillfully because, you know, at one level of that training, that practitioner would be willing to give away their body, to give away their life, right? They wouldn't feel any clinging to remaining if there was some great purpose that could be accomplished by the giving away of their body. They, they would be willing to do that. But that doesn't mean that we should just, you know, very easily or very quickly put our own lives in danger because we're not at that level. You know, that that practitioner who's genuinely not uh, attached to their to their body is someone who, when their mind separates from their body, they're going to be able to control, you know, the, that process through their meditation. Um, and there's no real; they're not in any real danger. We are in danger of when we lose our body because our mind is so untrained. You know, there is danger that negative karma might arise in our mind. So. It isn't to say that all levels of generosity are, or all trainings of generosity are appropriate for all levels of practitioner, but, you know, beginning to train in generosity to the best of our ability, um, you know, is, is important. Um, and it's also important not to exceed even, you know, even to go beyond what we might feel comfortable with, because if we regret engaging in an act of generosity, then that's a negative you know, karma as well. If we think, oh, I shouldn't have benefited that person, or if if our if our act of generosity comes with strings attached, then maybe we're trying. You know, we're going too quickly. So the next is the training in ethics or morality. Um, 
Uh, and so ethics, we've talked about that. We've talked about that training in ethics or morality, the pradimoksha vows, the five lay vows, or the vows of a monk or a nun, or the vows, um, the bodhisattva vows that a person might take. There's even a level of vows um, called the tantric vows, the vajrayana vows. Those are all different levels of uh, vows, of ethics, of, of morality. Uh, and so then patience, so basically that means, you know, never transgressing the vows that a person willingly takes, the trainings that a person willingly takes on. Um, patience is a mind that is able to uh, be undisturbed in the face of adversity, in the face of harm, a mind that remains calm, that remains, um, you know, as I say, un undisturbed, um, that, you know, is able to face adversity, hardship, difficulty, without resorting to anger, without resorting to malice, without um, causing harm in response to harm. It might seek a solution to a problem, um, but it would do so calmly, um, you know, in a, in a controlled way that doesn't resort to causing harm. And then joyous effort is also called... Um, enthusiastic perseverance, joyous effort, or enthusiastic perseverance. This is, um, the definition of this is to delight in virtue. Uh, so to, to not just think of one spiritual, you know, practices or trainings as, as a burden, but to think of it as something joyous, to think of something that, you know, that a person would willingly, you know, do um, day after day after day without, you know, uh, without getting discouraged, without feeling, you know, again, it's sort of the no strings attached uh, idea, just I will, I will work for the benefit of sentient beings, and I will do it, do it, you know, whatever the burdens that come with that, whatever obstacles there might be, whatever difficulties there might be, I will you know, move through them, um, and I won't get discouraged, I won't um, become despondent at how overwhelming it might seem. Um, so that's a training in joyous effort. And concentration refers to meditative concentration, refers to, and we'll talk a bit about um, the training in that uh, just coming up here. And then wisdom uh, refers to insight into the nature of reality. And we talked a little bit about that in terms of those two types of analytical meditation, the two uh, kind of purposes of analytical meditation. One, um, when you engage in analytical meditation, you um, might do that in order to generate your mind into a particular state like love or compassion or generosity or patience or um, or you might be trying to have an insight about the nature of things like impermanence or death um, you know you're not trying to generate your mind into impermanence your mind is impermanent but you're trying to understand the nature of impermanence through your um, meditation so wisdom is developing insight about the way things truly are about the you know and from the buddhist point of view of course you know other spiritual systems might disagree about you know this or that they might assert the existence of a unchanging soul or something but from the buddhist perspective wisdom is um, generating real insight into the actual nature of reality uh, and there's different ways of that the ultimate kind of wisdom is wisdom realizing um, what what in one way is called emptiness, which we'll talk about, you know, later, but then also uh, wisdom understanding impermanence, wisdom understanding um, one's own, you know, mortality. There's different other kinds of lesser wisdoms as well. So those are the six perfections um, that really form the, the basis of what a bodhisattva would be trying to accomplish with their meditation. And then the bodhisattva is also, not only are they progressing in understanding and practicing the six perfections, but they're also progressing through these five paths. So the path of accumulation 
uh, begins when a ordinary person becomes a bodhisattva, when they have that first direct realization of bodhicitta, and they become a bodhisattva, they enter into the path of accumulation. And on the path of accumulation, they are accumulating the causes and conditions to have a direct meditative realization of the nature of reality, of emptiness. Um, and so they're, they're amassing all of these conditions. Um, and then on the path of preparation, they are focusing not, they're focusing more on the path of preparation, on actually meditating on the nature of reality in preparation for seeing it directly for the first time. So on the path of accumulation, they might be um, more so emphasizing perhaps the other six perfections, um, merit, you know, meritorious activities, kind of creating the storehouse of merit, of wisdom, of sort of positive energy um, that is going to help them to see emptiness directly. And then they would begin to focus more on meditating directly on the nature of reality and doing that over and over and over again for a very long time. And then the boundary between the path of preparation and the path of seeing is that a person on the, when they enter into the path of seeing, they have seen emptiness directly for the first time. So um, on the path of preparation, they would have what's called uh, a conceptual realization of the nature of reality, which is a realization that is correct. Um, it's a correct, valid realization, but it's through the use of concepts. It's through the use of, um, you know, ideas about emptiness. It's not See, it's, it's like thinking about a place that you've been before rather than actually being in that place and looking at it and tasting and seeing and touching and actually being in direct contact. Um, so through the repetition of a correct inferential or a correct um, conceptual realization, that deepens into eventually a direct non-conceptual realization of that same object. So the object itself doesn't change. It's it's still the nature of reality, but it goes from or progresses from a conceptual understanding to a direct understanding. And once they see emptiness directly, then they enter into the path of meditation. So now they're just repeating that experience. Because um, unfortunately, if you see emptiness directly once in meditation, um, that is not enlightenment. That in and of itself in that one moment is not enlightenment. You do have to, that realization begins to purify the mind. It begins to chip away at all of the afflictions, the delusions. Um, and it's, I mean, it's incredibly powerful the very first time. And it, it you know, it's, um, it's a, you know, incredible thing, but it does have to be, you know, repeated. That experience has to be repeated over and over and over again as it gradually sort of clears away the stains of the mind, because those stains are very deeply, the stains of the afflictions, the basically all of the previous habituation to affliction that is there in the mind doesn't just instantly all completely disappear, but it's cleared away each time the meditation on emptiness is engaged in. And then the boundary between the path of meditation to the path of no more, no more learning is where that person does achieve enlightenment, where that person, um, you know, they actually uh, achieve the state of enlightenment on the path of meditation. And, and then the path of no more learning is really just the path of being a fully enlightened being. There's nothing more to do, nothing more to learn. You are now fully enlightened. Um, so you are, the bodhisattva is progressing both through the six perfections, they're training in the six perfections, and they're progressing through these five paths, these five paths of training. Um, and this all begins at the moment that a person 
has that direct non-conceptual realization of bodhicitta on the great scope. Any questions, thoughts, or questions about that? Okay. So then this is the next verse in Lama Tsongkhapa's Foundation of All Good Qualities. So here this says, when I, uh, once I have pacified distraction to wrong objects and correctly realized the meaning of reality, please bless me to generate quickly within my mind stream the unified path of calm abiding and special insight. So this is introducing uh, some new ideas, um, particularly, so here correctly analyze the meaning of reality refers to um, that training, that bodhisattva training on you know, the path of preparation, the path of meditation, where they are refining their understanding of the nature of reality or the emptiness um, of reality. And so then this is introducing this idea of calm abiding and special insight. So calm abiding is also called shamatha or shine. You, you may have come across those terms in various, it's um, another English translation is mental quiescence, but calm abiding is the most common of the English translations of shamatha or shine. Shine is the Tibetan, shamatha is the Sanskrit, um, but they're all just talking about the same thing, whether it's mental quiescence or calm abiding or shamatha or shine. They're talking about um, a meditative ability um, that Buddhist practitioners of all, all traditions um, train in. You know, Theravadan tradition, Mahayana tradition, it's all, this is something that uh, everyone is striving for, this particular meditative um, ability. So, and essentially what it, it refers to the skill of meditation itself. So you can describe meditation as both a process, as something that a person, something that a person does, and also something that a person can be good at doing and you know be comparatively good at doing because one one way of thinking about meditation is the ability to concentrate the mind on a given object a chosen object um, for as long as the practitioner wishes to remain in you know uh, absorbed into that object concentrated on that object without any change without any um, um, distractions arising in the mind, without that object um, changing in any way, without it becoming less intense or uh, duller or, you know, no, no change in the vibrancy, the immediacy of the object. And we know, of course, from our experience, when we try to meditate, that's very much not what we experience, right? We might say, okay, I'm going to meditate on you know, um, even just the breath, let's say, I'm going to just take my breath as the object, right? And that's our intention. But we know that very quickly, the mind goes to anything other than that physical, than that one physical sensation, it goes to what, what we're going to have for dinner, goes to a fight that we had earlier that day, it goes to, you know, something that we're stressed out about that we need to accomplish later on that day. So that's very much the the opposite of a person who has developed calm abiding. Um, a person, there's, technically speaking, there are what are called, there are nine levels, and we're not going to go into the nine levels of calm abiding, um, but it's just a way of, of describing how much progress a person has made to this ultimate goal of being able, as a meditator, to choose an object and then enter a very, very deep state of meditative concentration in which that object is the only thing that appears to the mind. No other object appears to the mind. Um, and that can be sustained even for weeks at a time if the practitioner wanted to. They probably, as a practical matter, they, you know, generally they wouldn't, um, but they could if they wanted to. They could just sit in meditation for a week, two weeks. Um, at some point, 
that have to get up and eat some food and drink some water. But their bodily systems really, really shut down because their mind is so concentrated. Um, their breathing, their respiration, their heart rate, everything slows, you know, way, way down as compared to someone who doesn't have calm abiding. Um, and so you can imagine that being able to do that is incredibly helpful is, you know, in terms of, because what we're trying to do, that the purpose of all of these, as I said before, these meditative, um, these topics, per perfect human rebirth, death and impermanence, um, karma, refuge, bodhicitta, renunciation, all of these topics are bodies of knowledge that are giving us solutions to problems, obstacles that we are facing that are the reason that we're not yet enlightened. We're not yet enlightened only because we are under the influence of karma and delusion uh, and we have, you know, we have... Um, assented to or agreed to kind of mistaken ways of perceiving and thinking about ourselves and about things outside of ourselves and anything that we cognize. So all of these different topics are clearing away these obstacles. And so you would imagine, you could imagine that it goes much faster and it's much more effective with calm abiding than without in terms of just the capacity of the mind of that practitioner to choose their object to absorb into their object in their mind and to have that you know in terms of how beneficial that session of meditation is it's, it's exceptionally more effective if the person has developed their mind to the to this high level as compared to someone who hasn't. And fortunately or unfortunately, um, the one realization, the one meditative realization that a practitioner actually can't have without fully qualified calm abiding is the realization of the nature of reality. Um, these other realizations, death and impermanence, karma, you, you know, of course, as I said, if you have calm abiding, your ability to realize those topics would be much faster, much easier, much more powerful. But you can actually do it without fully qualified calm abiding. You have to be a good meditator, but you don't have to actually get to this ninth level of fully qualified calm abiding. However, the realization of the nature of reality is not going to dawn in the mind of a practitioner who doesn't have fully qualified calm abiding. And that's true whether you're a Theravadan practitioner, because they also have to realize the nature of reality in the same way that at, whether you're achieving nirvana or you're achieving full enlightenment, the doorway is really the same. It's directly understanding the nature of reality, which depends on fully qualified calm abiding. So that's why it's so universally important. It's something that people really try to train in. Um, they try to train in meditation as a skill to get to the to this ninth level of fully. And you know, as I say, it's a it's kind of a made up system. You could you could devise a system that had twelve levels or a, a system that had six levels. Um, it's just a way of talking about progressing through different uh, meditative you know abilities. So if you are going to try to train in fully qualified calm abiding, it is something that you have to do in retreat. Um, if, you, uh, if a practitioner is going to be able to get to this ninth level, they can't do that in their normal daily life. It's, it's considered to be impossible. You can get to some level of calm abiding, you know, maybe the fifth level, you know, maybe the sixth level. But if a person is always, you know, going to work and taking care of a family um, and socializing, doing those sorts of normal things, um, and just has sort of a daily practice of an hour, you know, whatever it might be, they're going to sort of hit a wall with regard to calm abiding. So it becomes necessary to do retreat. And by retreat, I mean that you, you know, you sort of go off 
uh, somewhere where your food is taken care of, you don't have to go to a job, you're not socializing, um, you are literally just meditating all day, every day um, for, you know, really potentially a couple of years to get to this ninth level of fully qualified calm abiding. Um, that does, it's understood that that does become necessary at a certain point uh, if that is what you want to accomplish. And in that retreat, um, there are these factors that are talked about. So um, ethical restraint is the fundamental basis of being able to develop fully qualified calm abiding. If you are you know, going out and killing and stealing and being deceptive and doing, and then you're trying to come home and develop, you know, high levels of, of calm abiding, the agitation that you've introduced into your own mind through those unethical actions in and of itself is actually going to prevent you from developing fully qualified calm abiding. And then, as I said, you know, you really need a secluded, you know, place where there's not these distractions of daily life where you're, you know, you're just able to focus. And then this idea of proper diet is, you know, not eating too much, um, you know, not 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 eating food that isn't nutritious, that isn't really supporting your body. Uh, maybe fasting to some degree is helpful. Um, and then, you know, proper sleep and proper posture. You know, those are just things that, um, you know, support uh, your, your training and fully qualified calm abiding. In this long retreat that unfortunately is at some point going to become necessary if you want to to get to that ninth level. Any thoughts or questions? Not all good at the moment. All right. Okay, so that brings us to this idea of the, this nature of reality, of this idea that um, on the great scope, um, you would train in fully qualified calm abiding because you, you realize that if you don't train in fully qualified calm abiding, this ninth level, you won't be able to have a direct non-conceptual realization of the nature of reality. Um, and therefore enlightenment will be blocked for you. So that becomes necessary. And then once you do that, then you would really apply yourself to, to having this um, realization of the nature of reality or emptiness. I've, you know, generally tried to use the phrasing, the nature of reality, um, because emptiness in English, you know, comes along with a connotation. Um, so, you know, which may not, it may not necessarily be the best, you know, the best sort of preconceived notion that we may already have in our mind. It's also the, an, another English word that might be a bit better is voidness. Um, that might be a little bit better than emptiness because void, you know, what is a void? It is, a, it is an absence, right? If you, uh, put a cup down and it makes a ring of condensation on the outside, then on the inside of that, you know, it would be, a, there'd be a void. It would be, you know, a lack of that. Um, and that is maybe better as an, as a concept for what emptiness is. It is a lack of something. So what is it a lack of? So, it's a difficult, of course, this is the most difficult concept in Buddhism, this idea of the nature of reality, uh, the emptiness of all things in reality. But what it is essentially saying is that all things have an appearance and then they have, the appearance is also conventional reality. You could say there is a world of appearances or the world of conventional reality. And then there's the world of ultimate, you know, the ultimate nature of those things. 
And those are two sides of the same coin, the same object. All objects have both a conventional aspect and an ultimate aspect. Um, so when we, as ordinary sentient beings, observe objects, um, objects that can be cognized, as a ordinary sentient being that doesn't have this direct meditative realization of the nature of reality, what appears to us is conventional reality, is the world of appearance. So, and really it's the world of labels is another way of saying it. So we look in our room and we see, you know, a hundred different discrete objects, you know, a can, a computer, a light, a table, a cup, you know, uh, you know whatever it might be, speakers, um, different objects, a chair, a table, etc. And to our own mind, to our ordinary mind, our untrained mind, it seems as though these objects uh, exist separated from oneself, that outside, out there, there is that camera, there is that um, table or cup, and that it is entirely separate or divorced from the act of cognizing, from the subjective experience of oneself as the cognizer. Um, and we just see this label and we think, well, yes, of course, that is a table or a chair or a cup. Uh, and the Buddha says that each of those objects does exist in that way, and that way is helpful. You know, if you, there, in terms of navigating our environment, it is helpful and necessary to understand the conventional nature of those things. Because if you want to get a cup of, if you want to get a drink of water, right, you need to be able to understand that water comes out of the faucet, which is in the kitchen, and you put that in a cup and you bring it to your mouth and you swallow it. So there's a whole system of actions and assumptions that are necessary to navigate our worlds, you know, appropriately. Um, understanding the ultimate nature of those objects is in no way helpful, you know, for being able to do that. Um, but there is still a, an ultimate way of understanding all of those um, objects, all of those um, conventional objects. They also exist in an ultimate way as well. So the world of appearance is characterized by these things that are on the screen here. We've, talk, we've talked a bit about inherent existence, meaning that they seem to have something from their own side that sets them up as their label. That we're like, well, of course, that is a pen on my table, um, and it is a pen from its own side, completely independent of me or my subjective awareness. And it's always been a pen. It will always be a pen. Um, and it's just sort of broadcasting some... So there's some reason why I understand that a pen and a phone are different. They have different natures. They have different essences. And they're, they themselves are sort of broadcasting that essence, that nature to my mind. And my mind is noticing that this is a pen, this is a phone, and that the pen and the phone are just doing their own thing outside in the world. Um, and that they just, that's just how they exist. And unfortunately, we, when we relate to things in that way, although, as I say, that is helpful in that there's a practicality to that. It isn't actually how those things exist. They don't actually have natures or essences 
in and of themselves. They are not actually set up from their own side. They exist as what is called a dependent arising. Um, so that's their ultimate nature. Their conventional nature is their label, you know, and so on. What we've all agreed is a pen, is a cup, is a lamp, and so on. But all of those objects, their ultimate nature is what's called a dependent arising. And a dependent arising is that which has come together in dependence upon, so dependent arising, arising in dependence upon these three things that are here on this slide. So the first thing that all objects of our cognition um, depend upon for their existence are causes and conditions. So if we take, you know, a cup, right? A cup is comprised of materials, and those materials existed in some other form before they were treated in some way. Maybe they were extracted from a rock, and then they were refined, they were heated, they were cooled, they were, you know, impurities were removed, additional chemicals were added. Um, and then you can look at, of course, all of those individual components and recognize that each of those individual components has their own unique history of causes and conditions. Um, that rock that maybe contained the iron ore, at some point in the past, it wasn't a rock, it wasn't iron ore, it had some other form, and it it changed into that form, and it's still changing in some, you know, in some subtle ways, because all things are impermanent, right? So all things, as, as which this is beginning to rebut the world of appearance, because the world of appearance is a world in which we don't believe, or we don't take into account all of these causes and conditions. We just see the fully formed label, the fully formed object in front of us, and we relate to it simply as that label, as that object, without taking into account that it doesn't exist apart from all of the causes and conditions that have come together that that are responsible for that present moment um, existent of that object. So that's one way that that object depends upon for its existence. It depends upon causes and conditions. It also depends upon its own parts. So again, if we take a cup, um, you know, a mug or a cup or something, when we look at it, we relate to it, we regard it as simply a cup, right? One thing, or you could think about um, a car, right? We look at the car and we think of the car as unitary. If we look at the previous slide, um, you know, one of the uh, features of the world of appearance is this idea of unitary, right? So we look at a car and we think that is one thing that is car. And it can be, and it is one thing that is car because it has a nature, it has an essence of being car. However, that car or that cup is comprised of parts, right? It has a handle, it has a top, it has a bottom, it has, you know, an inside, an outside. Um, it, and without that, it's not a cup, right? If you take a cup and you cut out the bottom of the cup, then you couldn't really call it a cup because you tried to put water in it and the water would run out. Uh, you don't have a cup. You might have a handle, but still, if there's no bottom, it's not a cup. Um, if the sides are maybe only one inch high, then 
I'm not sure that's more like a saucer, right? That's not a cup. Um, because cup is something that we've invented. It's, it's made up, but it's something that we all agree on. And there's only a certain number of different permutations of that object that fall within that definition. And if you go outside that, it's no longer, we would no longer call it that. And something that, you know, if it can only hold this much water, if it has a flat bottom, but it's only an inch tall, um, you know, that's maybe closer to a bowl, maybe, but it's not a cup. Um, so the label of cup is something that depends upon an agreed upon set of parts. And just like a car, right? If a car um, didn't have an engine, then we wouldn't really call it a car. We would say, well, it's a broken car or it's not a functioning car, but we wouldn't say, well, yeah, that's my car. I'm going to go drive it to work tomorrow because we would know like it doesn't have an engine or if it didn't have any doors on it, we wouldn't, we wouldn't think about getting in it. We wouldn't think about using it for that purpose. And because we wouldn't think of using it for that purpose, we can't really say that it's a car uh, because the idea of car, the label of car, requires an agreed upon, you know, conceptual idea of what is a car. If it had, um, you know, a propeller on the top, then it's also not a car right now. It's more like a helicopter because helicopter is just another conception. It's just another made up idea that in order for that idea to be what is conceived of, it requires that part. It requires a rotating propeller that can generate lift and can move you through the air. So all objects really are, as I say, they're labels that we as people have assigned to these objects. And without the necessary parts, you would not be able to give rise to that world of appearance, that world of labels. And then the subtlest thing that um, all things depend upon in order to have a status as, as a thing in the world is an act of mental imputation, an act of mental labeling, as I said before. So we look at the thing on our desk that our water is in, that our tea is in, that we are drinking out of today, and we think, well, that is a cup, right? Because it is a vessel that can hold my water that I do drink out of. Um, I don't use it to um, you know, eat out of, I don't put soup in my, you know, I mean, generally you, you could, but, you know, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't, you know, put, uh, you know, some other, you wouldn't put batteries in it and be like, well, that's, you know, it's a battery holder. We, it could be that, but generally speaking, a cup is, the purpose of it is to drink out of, um, and so you see it and you recognize, okay, well, it has a handle on it. It has a flat bottom. It has five or six inch sides. And so I've seen that before. I've seen many different examples of that over the course of my life. So I know what label to give it. I know, you know, that that's what I do with that thing. When you look at the chair in your room, you have had a whole lifetime of looking at things that have a back, that have arms, that have a comfortable, you know, sitting area. And you know, well, of course, I can put books on it. I can, I can put my coat on it, but I wouldn't bring a friend in and say, well, this is my coat rack or this is my bookshelf. You would say that's my chair because its general purpose is to be sat on by humans. Um, that's generally what it's used for. So every object that we perceive, we label as, 
table, as chair, as, you know, lamp, and so on. And that is a whole process that depends upon all kinds of our own history, um, our own experiences, because you could imagine taking something from one culture to another culture and that other culture not having that same experience, not understanding, you know, maybe um, a native culture and you bring a laptop or something and they wouldn't know, well, okay, I, I open that, I can type on it, I can get on the internet. They wouldn't have any frame of reference in their culture for that. And they would have objects in their culture that you've never seen before and you wouldn't have a frame of reference for. So again, this is a way of refuting the world of appearance. Because if it's true that objects have an essence, if it's true that objects exist, independent from the observer, independent from the cognizer, independent from the act of cognition, then we ought to know what everything is intuitively. We ought to, if it's true that objects can broadcast an essence, which is kind of how we, when we're not analyzing, when we're just kind of experiencing our lives, that's kind of how we relate to things. If we're doing that accurately, then all things should be able to tell us what they are and what we can do with them. And that isn't true. We actually have to agree on a label based on our culture, based on, you know, what, um, what conventionally society has gotten together and said, you know, well, you sleep on a bed, you sit in a chair, you turn lights on and off with a switch, you, you know, find water to drink through faucets that look a certain way. They're typically in the kitchen, in the bathroom. Um, you know, it's all just social convention. It's all just agreed upon um, social convention. So there is this very active process to giving things labels, this act of mental imputation where because we are habituated to having been um, acculturated to seeing things that perform a specific function, um, you know, we, we recognize that things that look like cars are things that you get in to go from one place to another, that things that look like airplanes are things that you get in to fly from one place to another, that a pen is something that you pick up and write with. We have that knowledge in our mind. And so every time something that looks like that appears to the mind, we are able to impute a label to that object in a very active way. But the problem is, from the Buddhist perspective, that we don't take into account what's actually happening, and we remain on the level of the world of appearances. We, we remain thinking because we haven't really trained our mind to see things in this critical way, to dissect them in this critical way, we only see the world of appearance. And so we're then stuck with this view that, that these things are, as it, as it said before, you know, unitary, self-supporting, set up from their own side. And it is as if, from our side, it is as if the car is something that is in possession of all of its parts, right? We don't think that the car is comprised of parts, we think, or that the car is comprised of causes and conditions. We think that the car is the owner, the idea that that, that is the, the door of the car, that that is the steering wheel of the car, that it is as if the car is that which owns all of its parts. Um, not that the car arises in dependence upon 
all of its parts. And so that is a mistake that we are making about getting confused between the world of appearance and the real ultimate nature of things. And the, the most impactful way that this shows up is when we are relating to our own identity. Because our identity is an object that we are able to cognize in the same way that we're able to cognize things that are outside of ourselves. We can cognize, again, tables and chairs and so on. And when we do that, we're making the same mistake. We are imbuing all of those things with this unitary, self-supporting, self-sufficient kind of essence. But critically, we're doing this when we think about our own conception of ourselves. We don't recognize that we ourselves are a dependent arising in the same way that tables and chairs and cats and dogs and lamps and carpets and all of the all external phenomena are dependent arisings. And so we think that there is that we that we have an essence that we have something that just like a car is the owner of all of the car parts we think that there is something in here that is the owner of body and mind that is the owner of all that we are um, and the buddha says no that we just like a car are also a dependent arising our body, our mind, they are phenomena, they are real phenomena that exist, um, but they depend upon causes and conditions for their existence, they depend upon parts, and they depend upon an act of mental labeling, an act of mental imputation. So things do exist, to go to the next slide, um, this does not mean, this way of thinking about things does not mean that there is nothingness, that does not mean that, you know, nothing exists. Things do exist, but things simply do not exist in the way that they appear to the ordinary mind. The world of appearance is not all that there is. It, things don't have that same kind of unitary, self-supporting, self-sufficient sort of essence that, um, that we think uncritically, that we think that they have. So when we think of ourselves as existing in a unitary way, self-supporting, self-sufficient, and so on, then from the Buddhist perspective, that is what gives rise to all kinds of problems down the line. That is the root cause of all of the, the problems that arise because we see things, we observe phenomena, and we label them as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. We talked about that in you know the first class. We we might really like chocolate cake. We might really despise, you know, cooked spinach, something I don't enjoy. Um, and we might be neutral about, you know, number two pencils. Um, you know, so we see a number two pencil and we're just like, well, yeah, it's a number two pencil. But we see a chocolate cake and we're like, yes, please, you know, I want the chocolate cake. And we see the pile of cooked spinach giving off the sulfuric, you know, fumes. And we're like, no, please get that away from me. So the problem with that is the problem with relating to ourselves through just the appearance of the self rather than the ultimate nature of the self is that we lack the ability to have any distance, to have any objectivity in the mind. We we get caught up in bringing in pleasant things to our 
into our experience in rejecting things that seem unpleasant and then just being kind of ignorant or uninterested in things that don't seem to be benefiting us, don't seem to be um, harming us, you know, things that are neutral. Um, so that gives rise to anger, attachment, um, and ignorance, you know, ignorance here in the sense of just being disinterested in terms of not wanting to investigate, not wanting, not caring about things. Um, and on the basis of, because attachment is feeling as though one's happiness depends upon bringing in pleasant things, um, and aversion is feeling as though one's happiness is threatened by not successfully being able to separate oneself from things that seem unpleasant. And then when attachment and aversion become these predominant drives in the mind, well, now we're engaging in all kinds of non-virtuous actions, right? We might steal things. We might lie to people. We might... Um, engage in sexual misconduct. We might engage in, um, you know, I mean, all manner of unethical behavior in service to these fundamental drives of attachment and aversion that exist because we, when we think of ourselves, we think of ourselves not as a dependent arising, not as something that has parts, that has, you know, um, causes and conditions that's labeled by the mind, but as something that has an essence, as something that we have this intuitive mistaken, intuitive not in the sense of like accurate, accurately intuitive, but um, in terms of unconscious, unbidden uh, view that there's something real, findable inside of me that is the owner of my body and my mind. Uh, we, you know, we, we talk that way. We say, my hand hurts, or we say, I'm angry, right? Anger in that instance is a state of mind that's occurring in our mind at that time. And if, if the hand, if our right hand is in pain, well, then there's nerves in that hand that are having a certain experience. But in either case, we say, I am angry or my hand is hurting. And so there's this idea that both the body and the mind are that which is owned by some undefinable me, some undefinable essence um, that's really findable that I can that I can pinpoint. We have this sense that that's how it is. And the Buddha says, no, um, in the same, when this idea here on the slide, emptiness is that which is unfindable under analysis. So what the Buddha is wanting us to do is, is interrogate the world of appearance, right? So when we look at a car and we think, well, yeah, that is a car from its own side out there, separate from me, then if that's true, then at, we should be able to articulate what that essence of the car is. But if you actually try to engage in that process of articulating why you think that, then what you might do is you might separate, you know, in a warehouse, you might take apart that car and then you would have a handle and a door and a a trunk and a, all of the wheels, all of the fabric, the, the, you know, the seats, the engine, all of the different thousands and thousands of different parts. And you spread all of those thousands and thousands of parts in this warehouse. And then where is the car? Where among all of those parts is the car? Um, you, you don't find one. It's not findable. Uh, and yet when the car is there and then, but then that car gets a scratch on it, right? Your car gets a scratch on it and you have this visceral reaction. You have this, you know, reaction because you feel like the car was damaged, you know, not that there's 
a scratch on some paint, but that like this thing, this unitary thing of the car it was actually damaged in some way. But the car can't really be damaged because there is no actual car from its own side, separate from parts, separate from causes and conditions, separate from an act of mental imputation or an act of mental labeling. So in the same way, there is no I that exists independent upon the causes and the conditions of the body and the mind, the parts of the body and the mind, and then the act of mental imputation that just decided that when body and mind are together, we're going to call that the I, we're going to call that me. Um, that's the act of mental imputation. We observe body and mind together, and we just label that as me. But we don't we don't hold that lightly. We don't hold that in as a dependent arising, right? And that's the lack of wisdom that we have as, a, as just an ordinary sentient being. We're not holding that through the lens of wisdom, seeing it as a dependent arising. We, we see it in this really overly concretized way, in this overly, um, this really heavy, um, tight, concretized way of saying, well, no, they're really, when, when someone says something unpleasant to me, I, there's something in here that's really harmed by that, that, that receives that insult. There, there is a me, there is an I. Um, we, we feel that way. And as long as we feel that way, we're going to, as I, you know, as I mentioned, there's going to be all of these knock on effects of attachment arising in the mind, aversion arising in the mind, karma being engaged in on the basis of attachment and aversion. And that also another major implication of that is that we're going to go through the death process um, at the end of this life, and then we're going to do it again at the end of the next life and so on. And if at that time, we are still holding on to this idea of a real findable essence that is me, then we experience that death process as happening to a real findable true me. I, I am dying. I am ceasing. Um, and then Th what happens because of that is that we are almost inevitably going to trigger strong karmic seeds of grasping at existence, at grasping, because we feel like something real is slipping away. We feel, because it, it's a big transition, right? The body and the mind are separating. The mind is having a very different experience of going from this incarnation to the intermediate state. Um, it's, it's a very dramatic change in what the mind is experiencing. And if we're tightly holding on to a me, an I, then that's going to, we're going to sort of be fighting against that experience. And there's going to be this sort of innate drive to grasp at existence, which is going to trigger our next incarnation, is going to be the principal cause of throwing us into a, another ordinary samsaric rebirth, right? Which is not what we want if what we want is enlightenment. You know, we don't want to be grasping so tightly onto this conception of an identity that we trigger another rebirth because then that's going to just happen again when we die again in the next life. And then we're going to die again in the next life because this ignorance of the, you know, this what's called malrigpa, fundamental ignorance, this lack of, of, a real understanding of all things as dependent arisings is not part of our experience. As long as it's not part of our experience, we're kind of powerless to 
experience the world in that way, in that way of attachment, in that way of aversion, in that way of grasping, um, which isn't, you know, isn't problematic as long as you don't want to achieve enlightenment. If you're happy to just continue to get more and more samsaric rebirths, then, you know, no big deal. But if your goal is to achieve either individual enlightenment or full enlightenment, then it is simply an obstacle to that. It is going to block that result. Um, so from the Buddhist perspective, it is something to, to be overcome. It is something, this, our, our present lack of understanding of the actual ultimate nature of reality is something to be overcome um, because only by overcoming it can you really cut the root of attachment, of aversion, of all, and then all of the secondary malice and jealousy and, you know, all of the secondary and tertiary, all of these other negative states of mind, they all are traceable to the fact that we hold our identity in an overly concretized way. Um, not seeing it, again, simply not seeing it as a dependent arising, relating to it wrongly as something that we think we know how to find it. We think we know, you know, that, that there is something that really is me. But the Buddha is, is encouraging us to look for it, is encouraging us to examine that belief. And his experience is that if you actually do that, if you actually interrogate your experience of yourself, you will come to the understanding that you do exist, but you exist as a dependent arising, independent upon causes and conditions, parts, and an act of mental imputation. You do not exist as a unitary, self-sufficient, self-supporting, findable, kind of intrinsic essence that is, is separate from causes and conditions, parts, and an act of mental imputation. So everything in Buddhism is preparing us for this insight. Um, everything is preparing the ground for us to have the kind of mind that can be successful in analyzing the world of appearance and coming to an understanding that conventional reality exists, but it only ex exists conventionally. There is a deeper layer to conventional reality, which is that when you interrogate it when you try to find the essence you you're unable to and and that's all that there is it's what's called a non-affirming negation um, we're not positing the buddha is not positing something else in in place of that the buddha is just saying what you think exists isn't actually findable when you search for it that you we have this innate way of relating to things as if they're permanent, as if they're unitary, as if they're self-supporting, as if they're self-sufficient. And when we actually try to determine what is it in that thing that is responsible for our experience of that thing, it is not possible to actually pinpoint why that false appearance is dawning in the mind. And then you just simply rest your mind in that understanding that, that things don't exist as they appear. There's not something that's posited in place of that. There isn't, it's not like, oh, but it really is like this. It's not like this, but it is like this. That's not what the Buddha is trying to get us to do. He's simply trying to get us to undermine the permanent, unitary, self-sufficient, self-supporting view that we innately have of everything that we cognize. And that's enough. It is enough 
to come to a, a direct understanding that things are not that, that um, yes, they may have some existence, but it is, it is different than, it is other than how we are perceiving it, um, you know, with our ordinary mind. So that's just kind of, yeah, kind of a broad overview of that topic that um, is really ultimately the point, that this is ultimately what is liberating, you know, that um, this is the key to enlightenment. This is, this is the doorway into enlightenment. So it isn't the only thing that we do, as of course we've talked about. We've got the small scope, we've got the middle scope, we've got all of these other things that we have to do to prepare our mind to be successful in accomplishing this contemplation. But all roads are leading us here. Everything, this is the this is the point of what the Buddha is trying to get us to, to understand. Okay. Thoughts, questions? I know it's, it's a lot. No questions, no thoughts. Just just trying to sing it all in. <laughs> so that is actually the last piece of information to to cover on the nature of yeah, to cover on a uh, on emptiness that I had. Is there anything that would be helpful from anything that we've covered in the course? Um, I, I just keep um, watching and trying to learn, get it to sink in and um, bit by bit. Um, hopefully it will I'll get a better understanding. <laughs> but thank you. Sure. Let's see. Hang on. Whoop. I think that's all that I had. I think so. Yeah, so I mean, that is the, um, yeah, that's the path of uh, no more learning. You know, is again, everything at the, at the very end, emptiness is what, really what it is the last sort of major practice of a bodhisattva. Um, is really just, um, you know, of course, developing calm abiding um, and then really putting all of their time, all of their energy, all of their effort into realizing the nature of reality. Um, because if we don't do that, then we can never, you know, if that's because how we're relating to ourselves, as I said, you know, that's where it all comes down to. If we can learn to relate to ourselves in that very light way of a dependent arising, like, well, yeah, there is a, you know, I do have a body, I do have a mind, they are connected. And, but, you know, the body depends upon parts, the body depends upon causes and conditions, the mind depends upon bar parts, the mind depends upon causes and conditions. Um, the connection between body and mind is dynamic, it's changeable, it's impermanent, um, then, you know, that is a very realistic way of relating, you know, to how we exist. It isn't to say that, you know, we're just 
completely hallucinating everything. There is a, you know, there is a body, there is a mind. That's true. Um, they are connected. They are, we're having a subjective experience. But if we can start to relate to our own thoughts, our own impulses, our own desires, our own likes and dislikes, you know, through the eyes of wisdom, realizing that um, we don't have that same, we don't, that there isn't something inside, that there isn't a, the word that they often use is homunculus in English. It's like this idea of a little, a little mini me in there, like pulling the, the gears and the levers, like a controller. Um, if we can get, if we can kind of recognize that that isn't true, that, that we don't need that. Venerable Rabina says that, you know, that, that that is an unnecessary elaboration on what's true. You know, you don't need to posit the idea because there is body, there is mind, they are connected and that's sufficient. Like you don't need a third thing. You don't need to say that there is something that is owner of body and mind. That is a fabrication. That is something that, that is sort of just a story that we tell ourselves, that there's a third thing, that there's something over and above body and mind. Just like, you know, if you have a cookie, right, you you kind of think, well, the cookie isn't just flour and butter and sugar and chocolate and, you know, heat. The cookie is a thing that it owns the chocolate chips and the, you know, you, it's unitary, right? It's one thing that, and and that's not true. Like, it really is nothing, you don't need you know, you can make it, right? You can you can literally buy the flour, the sugar, the eggs, the chocolate. You can mix it together. You can put it in the oven and you, you can watch it, right? You can actually create it. Uh, but then even once you've done that, in the next moment, now you've got this thing that you've seen before that you've been in relation to that, you know, you see in the stores, you've seen like, oh, that's a cookie. And now all that appears to the mind is the label of cookie not even though you yourself, you just made it, like you just put it together. You saw the parts, you saw the causes and the conditions. You know that it required heat. You know that it required yeast and, you know, all of these things. But you're just like, oh, that's a cookie. I want the cookie, you know, from its own side. And you want to bring it into your experience. Um, but if you can just see that it's sort of, it's not, as solid. It's not as concrete. It doesn't have its own independent, that it's that postulating the idea of a, of an owner is just never actually, is not in line with reality. It's not, it doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't serve a unique function, right? You don't, when you, if you can fully describe the body and you can fully describe the mind and you can fully describe the way in which body and mind are interrelated, you're done. Like you've, you've accomplished everything that is a person. Um, you've accomplished fully articulating everything that it, that is oneself. And yet we still feel like we need a third thing that that is over and above everything that is body and everything that is mind. Uh, and that's the fundamental mistake that we're making. Um, but seeing through that, I mean, of course, if it was easy to see through that, we'd all be enlightened very, it's incredibly sticky. You know, that, that mistake that we're making is pervasive and very, very deep in the mind. Um, and so it, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it, I mean, you know, and even just fully qualified calm abiding, which is necessary to see this directly, requires a lot of time and effort and dedication and, you know, retreat and so on, as we said. And so that's why, you know, the unenlightened condition has its own momentum to it. As I said, you know, we will experience this death. And if we experience it in this grasping way, then it's just the sort of the laws of nature. We're going to give rise to another ordinary rebirth. And then that, so ordinary, ordinary existence comes with a momentum to it. It's kind of like 
we're just sort of taking the path of least resistance, you know, because it's easier to assent to the world of appearance than to see through the world of appearance. That's just easier to do. And as long as we continue to assent to the world of appearance, then that momentum of unenlightened experience will continue to be driving the show. Uh, and Buddhism is about seeing the disadvantages of that recognizing the advantages of enlightenment and just saying, well, no, I am going to do what's necessary to stop that momentum of unenlightened experience, to have a different experience by training my mind in a new way of relating um, to how I relate to myself. And of course, as we said, you know, everything is empty. So we can analyze external things with regard to their, you know, the emptiness of the cup, the emptiness of the table, we can do that. But the most impactful thing is to see the emptiness of the self, um, because the self is what is, is where attachment is arising. It's where a, aversion is arising. It's it, those states of mind are then subsequently going to color all of our experiences. So taking oneself as the object of that contemplation is the most useful thing to be doing. Um, but it, I mean, this is all on the great scope. So we have to be patient and we have to kind of start at the small scope and really work it, you know, work the small scope and, and uh, recognize that it's a very long process. Um, but that's, yeah, that's Buddhism in a nutshell, I guess. Uh, so 